Genesis chapter 2, and while, while you're turning there, I should go ahead and tell you I set out this week with the goal to prepare a message that would not be too terribly long, but I am not a perfect person, and that is my cross to bear. While you're turning to Genesis chapter 2, just past the table of contents, if you made it to Psalm, you went too far. While you're turning there, let me ask a question for just a moment. Have you ever noticed that there are differences between men and women? I mean, has anyone ever noticed that? Especially if you're married. Especially if you're married. I know for a fact that you've noticed that there are very practical, psychological differences between you and your spouse. Men and women are very, very different. God made them very, very differently. And I'm not even talking about physically. They are vastly different. As a friend of mine used to say, that's why we used to have different bathrooms. I mean, just the way that we live our lives and the way that we think in the day to day is so very different. I don't think any, I don't think anything contrasts these differences better than marriage. I asked Julia this past week, as a woman, what are some things that confuses her about men, and me in particular, I guess, and with rather hurtful quickness, she answered that she doesn't understand how men have the ability to walk into a room and not see things that are right in front of them. For example, she said, an overflowing trash can, boots on the floor, the ketchup bottle in the refrigerator directly in the line of sight, yet still me saying, we don't have any ketchup. She answered that quicker than I was expecting. Sometimes my wife will go out with her her sister or some of the ladies from church, and when she gets home, she'll give me a play-by-play of everything that was said, almost a full transcript, how everyone felt about what was said, how everyone felt after it was said, what's going going on in their homes and in their lives, how she feels about what was said after she got home thinking about what was said, and a full transcript. I go and hang out with some of my friends, and she lovingly asked me what we talked about, and my answer, nothing. (laughs) For a long time, she would follow that up with, so you guys hung out at Waffle House for three hours and you didn't talk about anything? So I would start answering guns, politics, the Bible, I, that, that's my categories. I don't know what else to talk about. But then, then she changed tactics on me. She got smart. She started asking specific questions. So now if you're uh, one of my friends and we're meeting together and you see me taking notes, I'm writing down what I need to say when I get home when I'm asked, what did y'all talk about? <laughs> Men and women are on totally different operating systems. If you're married, you know this all too well. One of the kids gets hurt or seems a little sick, and half of the marriage says, do we need to go to the emergency room? And the other half, no matter how major the injury, I will keep an eye on it. When the wife goes to the store, she's, she's looking for shampoo that is separate from conditioner, and that is for her hair type, for her hair color, for her hair style, and in her hair stage of life. When men go to the store, we're looking for shampoo that can be used as conditioner, face wash, body wash, dishwasher, car wash, and maybe even for the dog, too. I once read an author illustrate that men are waffles and women are spaghetti. I didn't fully appreciate this until we got married and I asked my wife one day what was wrong and apparently every single problem in her universe is deeply connected and intertwined to every other problem in her universe. For me, they're all in separate boxes. When we got pregnant one of the many times, and by we I mostly mean my wife, Um, I asked her in the beginning of the pregnancy, honey, what's wrong? We have a baby coming in nine months. She was panicked. She was worried. My brain said, I got nine months to deal with that today. I got to cut the grass. (laughs) We are totally different. God has made us different, and it is by his design that we are. Pastor Doug Wilson pointed out one time that a woman is likely to read between the lines and pick up all the vibes and feelings in a room, all the things that weren't actually said, while men tend to miss what was spoken out loud in English. (laughs) And all the wives amen. Men and women are different. 
vastly different. Mac and PC different. East and West different. Football and baseball different. And these differences are vast and have been a great mystery for mostly men, but men and women throughout history. And I bring your attention to the mystery of these differences today to tell you that in looking at the biblical family, I will not solve any of these mysteries today. Men, you will leave here today still wondering why she needs 45 pairs of shoes, and wives, you will leave here today wondering why his socks are still on the armchair. (laughs) We're not solving those problems. But we have spent the last couple weeks talking about biblical government. When I say government, the chances are that the federal beast that lords over us is what comes to your mind. Most people today, when they hear the word government, think of President Biden, Washington, D.C., taxes, Congress, the White House, the beast of the Antichrist. And while it is true that this is an example of government, Reformed Christians have historically held that there are actually three different forms of government that have been instituted by God. Three governments, all ordained by God and given specific boundaries, specific Uh, specific officers and specific laws by which they operate. There's the civil government, the one that we're all most familiar with, mostly because it likes to keep its hands in our pocketbook. There's the church government, such as uh, the church here where we have elders that rule over members, deacons who serve members, biblical law that guides elders, deacons, and members. And then And I would actually argue most valuable of all, we have the family government. The family government. Three governments, civil, church, and family, all instituted by God and all functioning in relation to each other. Picture a Venn diagram with three circles overlapping in certain places. But most of us are not accustomed to thinking about the family government as a government, but that is exactly what it is. That is exactly how God has set it up. God instituted it. God gave it specific duties, specific boundaries, specific responsibilities and laws. God ordained specific rulers, being the parents, and subjects, being the children, with specific instructions and goals on what to do and how to live and what direction to go in. Our homes, our families, are governments that God has instituted And we must return to a biblical view of family government or we will continue the free fall into chaos that our culture is experiencing. Before there was a church, there was the family. Before there was a civil government, there was the family. It was the first government that God instituted in the Garden of Eden. It was set before everything else and it sets the tone for everything else. This is why I said a few moments ago that I think the family government is the most valuable government set forth by God. The majority of the problems we deal with on a societal level happen downstream from the family. They happen in culture because the family unit has already been broken. The serpent didn't even attack God's creation until after the family was instituted. And what did he do? He sought to usurp the family order by deceiving the woman. Friends, this has always been the serpent's play. This has always been the enemy's tactic. The destruction of the family government has always been his move. That's why abortion, homosexuality, pornography, fornication, transgenderism, divorce, adultery, all run rampant in our culture. It is about the destruction of God's family. If the family is corrupted, if the family falls, so does everything else. When the family government falls, we see its ripple effects in all other forms of government. When the family government falls, the world falls with it. R.J. Rushduni wrote that the family is the child's first school where he, where he receives his basic education. His first church where he is taught his first and foundational lessons concerning God and life. His first state where he learns the elements for law and order and obeys them. His first vocation wherein the child is given work to do. The family is the first government. Now I want to I want to say at the outset of this, we're going to look at the biblical family. We're going to look at the family as God instituted, the family as God has structured it in the scriptures. And the reality is, there are many of us in this room who our family does not fit 
what the scripture says about this. Brokenness abounds. Sin, pain, and suffering abounds. But when we look in the scriptures and we see something that is different from what we have, different from what we are, even if it's not a sin issue, even if it's an issue that's entirely outside of our control and outside of our ability, we don't reject it. We affirm it as this is what God has said. This is what is ideal. This is what God has blessed. We're Christians. We love what he says in this book. So what is the family? How does God define a family? What, what, what does a family do? Who does what in a family? How should a Christian family look? Why is our culture so determined to undermine the biblical family? To answer these questions, let's turn to the very beginning, the origin of the family in Genesis chapter 2. In Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 7, we read, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Okay, that's the background. Jump over to verse 15 now. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This now is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. This is the word of the Lord. In order to properly understand family government, let's look at this chapter, at the, at the characters involved in the family. God has designed the family to function with specific characters, specific types of people playing specific roles in relation to one another. And this constitutes the economy of the family government. This is how God set it up. This is how God structured it. He gave certain people certain roles, certain responsibilities to do certain things based on who they are. The first character we meet in this family is the man, the husband, the father, the head of the household. In this particular text, Adam. Looking at Adam, we see what man was created for. We see that uh, what his role in creation and in the family is for Adam's creation is the archetype, the original, the ideal. This is what God placed him here to do and therefore what God placed us here to do. What, what do we see from Adam? First, we see that Adam was created as a man. He was created male. He was created biologically as the male sex. God created a man. Why do I emphasize that? Because God didn't give Adam 247 choices under the made-up category of gender. God didn't ask Adam what he felt like he was. He created him a man. Adam didn't get a vote in this. The culture around Adam didn't get a say. Adam was created a man. God didn't ask him what he felt like. He created him as male as God intended him to be. God made that decision and there will never be a reconsideration. 50 years ago, that made perfect sense. It wouldn't even be a point in a sermon. Oh, how the times have changed. 
Now, many would consider this to be hate speech. And, of course, the thought of being accused of hate speech really keeps me up at night. Jesus reiterates what we read here in Genesis when he says that, Have you not read that from the beginning God made them male and female? Male and female. Only two options. God created Adam as a man, and Adam had absolutely no say in the matter. It doesn't matter how a person feels on the inside. What matters is the reality that God has made them in. It doesn't matter what the culture around you says. It doesn't matter what your friends at work might say. It doesn't matter what your family members might say. It doesn't matter who says what God has spoken, and he has said, I create them male and female, and that is it. He creates He sets that in stone. Not us, not anyone else. The doctor didn't assign this at birth. God assigned it when he determined to create. It doesn't matter what we feel deep down. God created you either male or female. Any attempt by the world to muddy these waters, to claim that there are multiple alternatives under the fake category of gender, is ultimately an attempt to undermine the first government, the family government. Listen, friends, muddying the waters of the difference between male and female does nothing more than undermine what God has intended for the biblical family. What God has intended for man and woman. All of this nonsense about binary, non-binary, transgender, etc. is nonsense that is intent to undermine the family that God instituted. It is opposition to the creator. It is against the created order. It is attempting to undermine God's plan. God created Adam as a male, and as we will see, Eve as a female. You don't get to family government without this basic foundation. You don't get a biblical picture of family government without this basic foundation. The sex that God created you in, male or female, is integral to who you are as a person, who you are as a Christian, and what your role is in the family that God has instituted. What do I mean by that as a Christian? If you're a man and you want to be more Christ-like, You are to be more Christ-like as a male. If you are a female and you need to be more Christ-like, you are to be more Christ-like as a female. God created you in this and there is no escaping from it. And, as we'll see, that means you have assigned roles and responsibilities in your household based off how God created you. We can't understand the biblical family without this. So men, as you hear me going through the creation of Adam here, embrace what Adam was made to be. Embrace what God created him for. Don't run from it. Don't ignore it. Embrace your manhood because without it, you can't be who God created you to be. And for the ladies here, when I get to Eve, the same goes for you. Whatever you have heard from culture about your role as female, your role as a woman, throw it away. What you hear from the origin of the family here is not for you to decide whether that's right for you or not. No, that has already been decided by God when he created you. It's for you to obey and love and do as he says, to embrace. God made Adam a male, and that defines his nature. That distinguishes him in his role. Second, God put Adam in the garden, at verse 15, to do what? The text says to cultivate and to keep. To cultivate and to keep. By the way, as a man, I'm so, God, I'm so glad that God explicitly said why he put Adam there. Go and do this to cultivate, and to keep. Men, you were made by God for this very purpose. You were created in the creation plan for this purpose, to cultivate and to keep. What does that mean? The word cultivate here is a Hebrew word that literally means to work. To work. Adam was to look out into the universe of vast creation, and he has work to do in it, to cultivate it so it was healthy, to create order and maintain it, to subdue it under his dominion by the work of his hands and the work of his offspring's hands. Men, you were made to work. You were made to labor. You were made to cultivate. You were made to bring order to the world that God has placed you in. 
It's in your very nature, and every attempt to avoid it, every attempt to embrace laziness, to not work, and to not work hard, is to reject your manhood and ultimately reject your place in God's family. Men were made to work. Now, I want to break from my usual rule and make a clarification here. There is an obvious difference between a lazy man who despises work and avoids it at all costs and a man who has labored for years and is now retired. There is a vast difference, and I want to make sure we acknowledge that. Whatever stage of life you may be in as a man, whether it is a young child in this room, whether it is a teenage male in this room, whether it is a young married man in this room, or whether it is an older saint male in this room, look to the ant. Don't be a sluggard in whatever place of life that is for you. If your stage of life is retirement, that doesn't preclude you from work. Sure, you, you may not be expected to put shingles on the church building, but there are people in this congregation who need your service. There's a family behind you that needs your work. Work for them. Work for this church. But you should work by serving your family. You should work by serving your church however you are able. On the other hand, if you're a young man in this congregation, maybe you're too young to work, I assure you there's men in this church who can give you work to do. Just ask. There's plenty of projects around the church to do. Amen? Man was created to cultivate, to work. Man wasn't created to spend countless hours on his backside watching sports. He wasn't created to spend countless hours with a controller in his hand and a screen in front of his face. Man wasn't created to spend untold hours on YouTube or social media. He was created for the express purpose to work in God's creation, to cultivate that creation that God has placed him over. That's why Adam was made. He was placed in a garden and told to cultivate that garden, to work in that garden. I am constantly at war with my yard, my garden, constantly at war. I tell Julia all the time that this is my yard, this is my garden, this is where God has given me dominion, and I want to constantly work to cultivate it, to make it beautiful, and to bring it under subjection. And she usually chuckles and walks away. But I'm determined on this. I'm devoted on this. And, of course, with record rainfall this year, the yard is winning the war right now. But my point is where God has placed you, wherever God has placed you, whatever God has placed under your dominion, wherever God has placed under your care, are you working to maintain it? Are you working to take care of it? Are you working to have it honor God? Or are we being lazy? and just letting it pass by. You cannot uphold your role as a man in the biblical family unless you first uphold your role as a man. You must work. You must cultivate. And take this a step for, uh, farther. Fathers, are you teaching your sons this? Are you teaching them to work hard? Are you giving them the example of what a man should do? Second, God commands Adam to keep the garden. What does that mean? The word keep here in the Hebrew means to have charge over, to guard, to protect. Interestingly, it's the same word that is later used after Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden when the text says that God placed an angel, a cherubim with a flaming sword to guard the Garden of Eden. It's the same word that's used there. Adam was created for the purpose of working and for the purpose of guarding, to work and to protect. God entrusted Adam with the protection of his garden from intruders, from any threats that may come. Men, you were made to protect. You were made to stand in the conflict, to oppose the threat, to wage war against those who would oppose what is true, good, and beautiful. You were created to stand guard against anything that would challenge God's word and God's work. That's why when you were a little boy, you found a stick and made it into a sword. Because this is part of your nature, to guard and protect. Men, dragons are, are going to come. Threats are already out there. There is a war raging, and you were created to stand guard in it, not to sit idly by. Adam was created as the head of the family government, taking orders only from God, and his role was to protect God's creation and the family government from any intruder that may harm it. 
practically, of course, the first thing that comes to mind is the, the physical protection of our homes and our families and our church and anywhere else we may be. As men, we're naturally drawn to that. This is the South, though. This is the panhandle of Florida. I don't have to elaborate on this one much. If someone breaks into your home in the middle of the night, I don't have to explain what it means to protect your home. Like I said, we're in the panhandle of Florida. You already know. That's the obvious. That's what we already know. But what about the not so obvious? How about protecting what is true, good, and beautiful, spiritually speaking? Men, are you guarding what comes into your homes? Are you guarding the influences over your wife and your children? Are you guarding your own hearts from the worldly influences and threats that are all around you? What's on your TV? What's coming into the ears of your family? What do you allow into their lives? Are you guarding these gates into your family? You were made for that purpose. Guarding, protecting, it's in your bones. It's part of your very nature. It's the role you were created to assume in the family government. What happens next in the text? Verse 18, God looks at Adam and he says that it's not good for man to be alone. And again, all the wives said amen. It's not good for man to be alone. Uh, Pastor Vody Bauckham translates this by saying, God looked at Adam and said, that boy ain't gonna make it. <laughs> that boy. And you know, I can tell you, um, having been married for quite a few years now, uh, if Julia were not around, actually many of you experienced this when my wife was very sick in pregnancy. I was ordering pizza every night to survive. We were not made to be alone. Amen. Adam was created he was placed in the garden. He is the representative of God's dominion. He is given his mission. And God, after all of this, after all of this, God says, it's not good for him to be alone. It's not good. Verse 19, God has Adam name all the animals in creation, showing that as God's representative, all of creation, all of the animals are under his rulership. They're under his authority. Adam is king and the world is subject to him. He is in charge, but in naming all the animals, we see that none of them are like Adam. None of them are suitable to him. So God sets out to create one that is suitable for Adam. He puts Adam to a deep sleep. He opens up his side and removes a rib. And from that rib, he fashions the first woman, Eve. Again, just like with Adam... Eve doesn't have a say in whatever sex God gives her. She is made female, and that's all there is to it. I want to point out briefly, though, how were the animals made in the text? They were made from the dirt of the ground. How was Eve made? She was made from Adam. She was made from the man. She is not one of the animals. She is not lower in the creation order than the animals. She is made from her husband. She is made from Adam. She is made from man who is in the image of God. Eve is the second character we meet in what constitutes the family government. And just like with Adam, let's take a few moments to look at the details to her creation to see what this means for womanhood. Remember, you don't get a family government by God's design without biblical manhood and biblical womanhood. So what do we see in Genesis 2 about the design and the role of the woman? First, we see why God created her. She is created to be Adam's helper. I will make him a helper suitable for him. She wasn't created to be the one who cultivates and keeps. Adam was. She was not created to be the one who rules over all creation, bringing order to it. Adam was. She was not created to be the one who protects, who wields the sword and guards against the dragon. Adam was. She was created to help him in doing those things. She was created to help him in doing those things. Adam was created for the mission. Eve was created for Adam. Why? Because he can't do it alone. He can't do it alone. The woman was created to be a helper for the man. What does this mean? This means that at no point, men, should we sacrifice our responsibilities or shirk our God-given roles to our wives or to other women because we're just too lazy to do it. We're to carry that, and she is to be our helper. 
The woman was created to be a helper for the man. How is she to help? In numerous ways, but probably the most important and most obvious, Genesis 1, 28. God said to the man and the woman, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. Adam couldn't do that on his own. Adam couldn't rule over all of creation on his own. He needed a woman. The woman was created to multiply, to give offspring to her husband. Listen to me carefully. This is countercultural. Cultural. This goes against what we're told in the world. To avoid marriage and to avoid childbearing is to intentionally do these things. I want to be clear about that. To intentionally avoid these things is to intentionally rob yourself of your womanhood. To say that I want no part in this whatsoever. That is, I want to have fun in life. I don't want to be married and have kids. You're throwing away the very, the very gift, the glory that God has given you. The woman was created to multiply, to give offspring. Having children, being fruitful and multiplying with a husband that she submits to is obedience to God and it is a glory. It's not something to be avoided. It's the place you were created to occupy in the family government. Love it, embrace it, cherish it with the honor that it deserves. Adam was created to subdue the entire earth to the glory of God. You are created to help him in doing that, and your primary way of doing that is being faithful and being fruitful and multiplying. Now, there's a myriad of other ways. Every husband in this building can attest. We need help in a lot of other ways. But at the very least, the very most obvious in the text that is there. What is the purpose of Eve's creation? To help Adam. What was Adam to do? Fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it, cultivate it, and guard it. That's impossible for Adam to do by himself. He needs a helper suitable for him. Eve was created to be that helper. I told the men to examine themselves and be sure that they are not being lazy men who do not work. Wives, women, are you being a helper to your husband? Or are you being a hindrance to him? Are you helping him or are you hurting him? And I'll let you think on that as I continue. As if that isn't con con uh, controversial enough today, what does verse 23 tell us? It tells us that the man named her. If the man naming all the animals was a sign of Adam's rulership over all creation, or his rulership over them, then what does that mean when he names Eve? That he is her head. That he is her head. Though she is his helpmate, though she is designed to help him, though she is made from him and therefore equal to him in dignity and worth, let me say that one more time so no one leaves here saying that Frank said something he didn't say, though she is equal to him in dignity and in worth, he is still the head. He still rules over her. He is still in charge. He is still the head. This is a highly controversial theme, but it's clear throughout all of Scripture. Man and woman are created equal in worth. That is not a question. Men are, men are not more valuable than women, and women are not more valuable than men. They are both in the image of God. They are both in the image of God. But even in the equality of value, there is still a biblical, a patriarchal hierarchy to it. The relationship of man and woman is not reversible. It can't be exchanged. Women are not created to lead as men are. Women are not created to guard and protect, to go to war and face battle as men are. In the church, despite the foolishness and the confusion that abounds around us, even in our own conventions right now, women are not called to preach or pastor the church as men are. The mantle of responsibility for the church, for the family, for the magistrate rests solely on the shoulders of Adam, of man. When the fruit was eaten in the garden, why did all of creation descend into chaos? Not because Eve ate it, because Adam did. He's responsible. He is responsible for it. I know this is not the message that the world wants you to hear. I know this is not the message that some of us in this room want to hear. 
I know that it's unpopular in the world today, and many in the church would disagree, but friends, we are Christians. And as Christians, we affirm and love what this book says. No matter what anyone else thinks about it, no matter how we feel about it, we are Christians and we affirm God's word. Male headship is integral to the biblical family government. The Apostle Paul, our our favorite feminist author, affirms this in 1 Timothy when he writes, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. Adam was created first, establishing his role as head of the family government. Eve was created second to be his helper. What does that mean? That means the responsibility that God has placed over all creation rests primarily on the shoulders of men. We don't pass that responsibility off. As men, we don't pass that responsibility off. And as women, you don't attempt to take that responsibility. It's not for you to bear. We've seen Adam, the father of the family government. We've seen Eve, the helper of the family government. Now we come to the third and final character in the family government, the children. The children. The third and final character or role we see in family government is a role, is a role that every one of us should relate to. Why? Because we were all children at one point. It is the role of the child, the offspring. See, for the man and the woman, we had to do some digging. We had to look at some Hebrew words and find out their purpose and their place in family government. For the kids, God is much more direct. And if you're a parent, you know why. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12 says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. This is what happens when Adam and Eve are fruitful and multiply. They are given children. And the command from God is for them to honor their father and their mother. What does that mean? Kids in the room, I want you to listen very closely to this. Children in the room, pay attention. What does it mean to obey and honor your mother and father? They rule over you. They're in charge over you. What mom and dad say goes. That's final. That's it. Your job as a child is to obey them, to submit to them. So long as you're not compelled to sin, you obey your mother and father. But there's more to it than just obeying. There's more to it than just obedience. There is honor. Honor your mother and father. Another way of saying it is don't do anything that would dishonor them. This is, a, this is a, a concept that we ignore in our culture, but we can never actually get away from. The way, uh, the way you carry yourself, children, young people, the way you carry yourself is a reflection on your mother and your father. Are you honoring them in the way you carry yourself? I remember being a small child sitting at a red light with my mother on Pace Boulevard. If you know where Pace Boulevard is, you have an idea of what it's like already. And we both looked out the window in time to see a man sprinting down the sidewalk in his underwear. I mean, he's booking it, running in his tidy whities A few moments later, a group of five or six police officers come out of nowhere and football tackle this man to the ground and cuff him and drag him off. And my mom looks at me and said, don't ever embarrass me like that. (laughs) Why? Because that would dishonor my mother and my father. For the record, that never happened to me, so I have not done that. (laughs) Honor your mother and your father. Kids, the way you live, the way you carry yourself, the way you act in public is a reflection on your mom and dad. God commands you to live in such a way that does not embarrass or bring shame to them, to live in such a way that is honoring to them. You should carry yourself in such a way that reflects the work they do in your lives. We've seen the characters that make up the family government, father, mother, child. In verse 24, we see the establishment of that family unit in the marriage of the husband and wife. Verse 24, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. That is the family that God blesses. That is the family that God has instituted. That is the family government that God has established. This is the family government that follows the created order. There is no state government yet. There is no church government yet. This is the first government that God gives. 
briefly turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. And I know the panic just swept the room. He's turning to a whole other chapter and book right now? This late in the sermon? What's going on? You should be used to this. Ephesians chapter 5, where we see the Apostle Paul deal with this text for just a moment. In Ephesians 5, Paul gives us some very practical principles of everything that we've just read in Genesis chapter 2. To the husband, Paul says, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are part of his body. Men, do you want to own the place God has given you in the family government? Then love your wives as Christ loved the church. Christ died for his church. In our culture today, we love to point out Christ washed the feet of his church. He served his church. But Christ also leads his church. Men, how do you best serve your families? By being the leader that they need you to be. By being the leader that they need you to be. Love your wife to death and take the role of leader in your home. Do not be sinfully passive. As a leader, that disqualifies you. As one of your elders who is not perfect in this myself, I challenge you, be a man and lead her in worship in your home. Lead your children in worship in your home. Wash her in the word. Bathe her in prayer so she might grow in sanctification and become more like Christ. Nourish her. Cherish her. Provide for all her needs. For as Paul says to Timothy, a man who does not provide for the needs of his household is worse than a sinner. What happened when Adam sinned? All of creation, everything that he had been given dominion over fell with him. Men, when we don't lead, when we don't take the mantle of responsibility, our families and everything that God has given us dominion over suffers. It suffers under us. As I've said before, the Bible commands to our weakness It commands you to do what you're not naturally inclined to do. The reason God commands you to love your life, love your wife the way Christ loves the church, is because your flesh is going to tempt you to not do so. Do you know why the Bible commands you to lead your family? Because your flesh is going to tempt you to be lazy and not do this. Going back to Genesis 2, you must work to overcome that. And you must stand guard so that this temptation doesn't get a foothold in your life. And to the woman, Paul writes, verse 22, Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Wives, show your husband you respect him by submitting to him. He is your head, God has given him charge over you. You are not to try and usurp his authority by domineering over him. This does not mean you submit when it's most beneficial for you either. He he told me to go out and get a new string of pearls, so I submitted. I obeyed. No, that's not what submission looks like, friends. Submission means that whatever crossroads your family comes to, whether it be financial, a job change, a, a vacation, moving, whatever crossroad it may be, your husband's word ought to be final and you ought to submit and trust him with joy. Why? Because God has placed him there. And quite frankly, you married him. When you did that, you allowed him to take that responsibility that God has placed him there for. Remember, the Bible commands our weakness. Why does Paul command you to submit? Because your flesh is going to desire to rule over your husband, and you must not let it. Verse 33, Nevertheless, as for you individually, each husband is to love his own wife the same as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Love 
and respect. These are the necessary ingredients for the family government that God blesses. Love and respect. In closing, Psalm 22 talks about the crucifixion of Christ. It is a prophecy. You don't have to turn there, but it talks about, there is a prophecy of the crucifixion of Christ. It gives us great detail about the death of our Savior. The text reads, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. This is the perspective of Christ on the cross. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with the lip. They wag their head, saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, because he delights in him. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue cleaves to my jaws. And you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil doers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Then the text makes a turn. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. So what the text is telling us real quick is that the crucifixion of Christ, Christ cries out to God and God heard him. The Father heard him. But verse 27 makes, a, makes an application of this. Verse 27, the crucifixion has occurred. God has heard the cry of Christ. Verse 27, all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. It will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it. One of the fruits of Christ's victory over the serpent is that all the families of the nations will worship before him, and it will be told to the next generation. Why do I mention that? Because the blood of Christ, the victory of the cross, the empty grave, the ascension to the right hand of God the Father Almighty doesn't just restore you individually as a broken sinner, it restores entire families, and it turns them to God. It turns them to the God who saves. Can we get an amen for that? Amen. The work of Christ restores broken families. If you've heard what we've preached today, if you've seen what the book says, if you've seen what God has said, and you say, that's not my family. That's not how we live. That's not how our family economy works. That's not how our family government is. Friends, Christ died to restore families to holiness. If you're in here today and you've, you've felt the pain and the suffering of family turmoil that is outside of your control, because let's be fair, that does exist in this world, that does exist in this, in this culture. There is broken families that are broken by people outside of us who have caused pain and suffering that we didn't bring upon ourselves. Friends, the blood of Christ restores even that. The blood of Christ restores even that. Let's pray. Thank you.